So those were actual words from real employees and real leaders that I've had the privilege to talk to. And they're expressing basically their challenge with each other. And I think what's really interesting when you listen to those quotes is they're not that different. When you hear the leader speak and then when you hear the employee speak, they're saying the same thing. And what are they saying? They're saying that I want a little more understanding, a little bit more compassion for my position, and a little empathy would go a long way, right? So two different voices, two different perspectives, but basically saying the same thing. So today, you're going to have an opportunity to kind of stop and reflect and sit back and explore what type of leadership legacy you would like to leave. Because you get to choose that. And today is the time to start that process if you haven't already. Because of the complexity of the business, it's getting more and more challenging for us to lead it and to lead a team to get anything done, right? I mean, you know, leadership was so much simpler before. So much simpler before, but today, it's just not. You know, we're dealing with, you know, matrix organizations, downsized structure, 24-7 work weeks, intranets, intranets. It's crazy, and the speed is unbelievable, right? So what does that mean? That means, as leaders, we have to manage all of that complexity. And how are we going to manage all that complexity? What is it going to take to do that? Well, I think what it's going to take is tapped in, tuned in, turned on, emotionally connected, and highly engaged employees, or we're not going to pull this off. I mean, you're going to have to be able to tap into all those possible resources because we don't have a lot of resources today. They're tighter and tighter. So that means you're going to have to tap into the creativity of all those people on your team in order to literally pull the rabbit out of the hat and make it work. Would you agree with that? Yeah, it's what it's going to take. All right, so then we go, how do we find those people that are tapped in and tuned in and highly engaged and emotionally connected and motivated to want to work for you, not have to work for you? And there's a difference. There's a big difference. If they have to work for you, you'll get, you'll get compliance for a while. But if they want to work for you, you get commitment. Honestly, what happened for me is when I asked that question about think about your best boss, I was scanning the room and looking at your physiology. And what I deducted, tell me if I'm wrong, that you thought of that person within about 15 seconds. Is that about right? OK, pretty close. OK. So now I want to hear, how long ago did you work for this person? Just shout out the numbers. 10? 10? 17, 15, 8, some current, which is great, because I don't always hear the current. But since they're sitting right next to you, I'm sure I'm going to hear current. <laughs> OK. <laughs> you know, OK, I get it. That's all right. It's all good, right? <laughs> but really, I don't often hear current, unless the person's sitting right next to them. But no, really, think about that for a moment. Wow. Think about that for a moment. Within 15 seconds, you thought of someone that you worked with eight years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. That person had an impact. That person left a very interesting legacy because you thought of that person within 15 seconds. That says something, doesn't it? It really does. So what we're going to do is you've just had your own personal experience of what it's like when you're motivated to perform your very best, why are you? Because of the list you put together. Believed in me, cared about me, listened to me, empowered me, but had personal interest in my development, who I was a human being, not just a worker, et cetera, et cetera, right? OK. So there's the answer. Now, what I also want to share with you is what we know from some of the interesting new research that is out that basically says that we are going to have to start leading in a more heart-centered way because of, again, the complexity of the business. So here's just a couple of pieces. So Jim Collins studied 1,400 companies. 11 of those companies were outstanding performers, had sustained business success over long periods of time, and their stock returns were three times the rate of market. Here's the common characteristics that those 11 companies had that deep personal humility, knowing who they were as leaders, and having the hum humbleness and humility to understand that it, they may have position power, but they need personal power to make it really, really work. 
They gave credit to others and accepted blame. And they had a lot of self-honesty, which is what I call looking in the mirror and being honest about who you are. Um, and had non-judgment towards themselves and others. This is a principle that is all about looking in the mirror and having the courage, and believe me, it takes courage to look in the mirror. And own up to your strengths, your weaknesses, the good, the bad, and the ugly, what you do really well, what you do not do well, and your ammo, <laughs> right? What is your ammo? And it's having the courage to look at that, which is not always easy to do. It's a very challenging thing to do. It can be humbling to admit that I'm not good at something like X, but I am good at this. But having that willingness for that personal growth to do that is absolutely the first step. There was an article on Heart Center Leadership in a magazine, and I got a call from a gentleman. He owns three businesses, lives in Canada. One of his businesses was a restaurant. And he called me because he had read the article and he saw this particular principle and he called me and he said, you know, I just want to tell you, I read this article and I saw these seven principles, but this know thyself principle really kind of landed for me. I said, well, that's great. You know, what is it about that particular principle that's meaning so much to you? And he says, well, you know, one of my businesses is a restaurant and I fired three general managers this year. Within one year, he went through three general managers and now I'm kind of wondering if it's me. And I'm thinking, yes, it is you. <laughs> you know? I'm going, yay! I mean, this is music to my ears to have somebody just ponder, just at least ponder, what part of this situation do I have to take personal responsibility and accountability for? It's not beating ourselves up. I would never suggest that. But you do have to ask the question, if I'm going through three general managers in a year, what part am I playing in this dynamic? Because there will be a part somewhere. What we've learned is that the health of managers makes a difference. We wanted to take a look at leaders holistically, mind, body, and spirit. They're the human being who has to lead, and there's all kinds of pressure in this role, as you know. Over and over again, scientists report that one of the best predictors of health and well-beings of employees is their own perception that their supervisors are healthy and provide them with support and encouragement. Which is really interesting when you think about it. And I, I will tell you, one of the leaders that I um, managed, we did her, we did his 360, and and uh, people tore him up on you know work no work life balance. He's here you know before any of us get here. He's here way after we all leave. I get 3 a.m. emails, et cetera, et cetera. And so when I debriefed it with him, he said, "Well, that's not anyone's business. That's my decision if I choose to do that." I said, "Ah, but you're making there's an impact here." And the impact of the message is, well, if he's here at 7 in the morning and he's here at 7 o'clock at night, I'm guessing he's expecting me to do that too. Right? And even though he said, well, I'm not expecting that, I said, but they don't, they don't know that. They feel that you are, you know, 3 o'clock in the morning email says you're, you're working all the time. Right? And so the beauty of that day, though, was for him and that team to come together and have the authentic conversation about why the 3 a.m. email what the impact of that was and that they could make some differences around that. But they want their leaders to be healthy. They want that for themselves and for them. And that last one, turn off electronics with your loved ones. Can I get a hallelujah for that? Hallelujah. Thank you. Oh, please, do you really, really have to have it on when you're having dinner with a significant other? No. Remember, there were years ago, we didn't have them. So guess what? We figured out how to do it. <laughs> we can do it. <laughs> really, be with the person. Be with the person. Not this person and this person and four more people. Oh my gosh, it's crazy, right? Electronics are fabulous and they're tools and they have a place, but tools are meant to be picked up when they're best utilized and put down when they're not. Don't disengage from that relationship, that precious relationship you're in the middle of, having that lunch, dinner, etc. All right, so we've come full circle here. So, in the beginning we talked about, you heard those quotes, those leaders' comments and those employees' comments and the sort of complexity of the two. They're saying the same thing. Understand me, have compassion for me, give me a little empathy now and then, it goes a long way, right? 
And then we did our toast, and I asked you to pick which one. If you could only pick one, and you picked the third. 100% of you picked the third, actually. That's not always happening. So hopefully today, these seven principles help you build the legacy that you're really looking to build for yourself. It's all possible. Thank you so much for your time and attention.